Welcome back to our series on materials informatics. We just talked about ensemble techniques with Random Forest, support vector machines with SVMs and FCCs. Uh, so we've got lots of tools at our disposal in addition to the linear models we talked about. So we're finally ready, I think, to start doing some things and seeing to what extent we can use these models for stuff we care about. And what better thing to address first Ralph, right out of the gate than extrapolation in materials informatics. I bring this up because when I used to go around giving talks about this, a, talk, a question I constantly got from people was, yeah, 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 but how will this ever do in the real world outside of your training data set? How's it gonna actually predict some new material, right? With some awesome properties. If it never saw anything like that, it can't extrapolate. It can only learn interpolations between its data. So can it, can't it? Let's sort of dive into this. We did a recent paper. We're gonna talk about it in the context of that paper uh, to sort of get to the bottom of this question, okay? So first off, it is true that machine learning generally can struggle with extrapolation. Just for example, take this data, X and Y data. What if I split this data up, we have our training set and our test set, and you'll notice that I chose it such that our training set is the lowest values of X, and your test set is ex only values that are greater than X that are outside of what we saw in our training set, okay? So the question is, will a machine learning model, which never saw an X value greater than whatever this is right here, will it be able to predict these upper ones, or will it fail? And the answer might surprise you, it surprised me, is that it depends. You can take a linear model, a simple y equals mx plus b, right, which is we understand like a very, very simple model. It can technically extrapolate, right? It kind of at least goes the right direction. It's not like there's a great model because there's lots of error here, right? The sum squared residuals are pretty large. So this isn't like an amazing R squared or anything, but it can extrapolate. It goes the right direction. So yeah, it ought to be able to. Now compare that with a random forest. Random forest algorithms are technically, mathematically, they're incapable of extrapolating. They can't do it, right? You, you can see that when it tries to predict these, it just does a hard cliff. It cannot do it. Right, it, it, it just can't do it. The leaves of the trees, it doesn't know how to find a branch that goes beyond anything ever learned on, right? Because it only averages between the trees that it built. So it can't, but linear models can. So I guess the answer is, can it extrapolate? Yeah, and it depends on which model you're using. And here we see that even you know the linear models that get no respect kind of do better in terms of extrapolation than a more sophisticated model like a random forest one. So let's dive into this a little bit more detail with a materials science example. What you're seeing here is a histogram of number of occurrences of different bulk modulus values. So we took everything from some database, this was either a flow or materials project, I can't remember which, but we basically said grab all the values for bulk modulus for all these materials and make a histogram which shows you the distribution of values that you could expect to see. And here's what we see. The distribution is not a normal distribution. In fact, it is what we call log normal, right? It's got a longer tail on one side than the other, okay? And critically, we notice that there are very few of these materials out here in the tail, but we're gonna call those our extraordinary compounds. So the question is, right, I hope you see what we're getting at here. If you train only on ordinary compounds, would you ever be able to predict these extraordinary compounds? And if so, to what precision? How effectively can you do it, right? Can you find them all or can you only find some of them? That's the question we set out to answer uh, in this paper, which you can read about in Computational Material Science, where I'm an associate editor. It's a great journal, check them out. Um, published this last year, okay, so or two years ago now. So in this case, here's how we went about going, doing this. We took our full data set of all that data and we knew that we needed to split some into our training data set and some into our test data set. We did this very carefully. We took the top 1% of all materials properties and we put them in the test set. So the training never got to see that top 1%. Then we took 15% of these normal materials and we added them in as well because we want to see how well it did on all of them, not just the extraordinary ones, okay? Everything else, the remaining 85% of our data, that was all available to train from. Now let's see how we do. Before we do that, I have to introduce a new term. We probably should have talked about this with metrics, but we forgot, so we're gonna introduce it now. You can't just go off of precision, meaning when it makes a prediction, if it said it was extraordinary, was it extraordinary, or did it, when it predicts a value, how close is it to that value? That doesn't tell the whole story, that's precision. You also need recall. Recall comes from like, if I were to tell you a list of numbers and I were to list 10 numbers off, and then I were to ask you to how many can you recall, if you could list back all 10, then you recall was 100%. You recalled all, all of them that should have been recalled, you were able to. Well, think about it like this. Uh, 
the recall is the fraction that should have been correctly classified that got correctly classified. That's different than precision. Like take a look over here. Here you see this circle and it's got green and it's got red and then the rest of it you've got your larger dark green rectangle and your gray rectangle. Well, these are the relevant elements and these are your retrieved elements. So the ones that your, your algorithm classified correctly are these ones in the green circle. But it didn't, it didn't correctly, I do all of them. First off, it said that these three were also part of your category. So these were misclassified. These are false positives. And it said that these ones were negative. It didn't put them in your category, but they should have been. So those are false negatives. That's the difference between precision and recall. Precision basically just says, okay, out of the ones that got classified, one, two, three, four, five, out of the total, one, two, three, plus five, eight. So five out of eight is our precision, meaning five out of eight times it classified things correctly. But recall says, yeah, 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 but you only classified one, two, three, four, five of the ones that should have been classified when there was another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There were seven more that didn't get classified correctly because it called them negative when they should have been positives, right? So that's recall is the green part of the circle divided by the green plus, you know, the total green section of the circle, uh, total green section of the data. Does that make sense? So that's the difference between precision and recall. They're both important. Precision is important. Recall is important. It depends on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to find all of something? Then recalls matter. And if you don't care about it, if you get a few wrong ones in there, then you minimize precision. We often want to maximize both to the extent possible, so we need a new metric that combines those together. One way to do that would be to calculate their harmonic mean, which we call the F1 score, where you do two times, you multiply them together, your precision and your recall scores, and you add them, you divide that by their sum, precision plus recall. That would give you the F1 score. Woo. So now we know how to talk about both precision and recall, so we're able to now talk about uh, how we do in extrapolating. Okay, So take a look here. I think this is really cool. First consider the figure on the left. This is with a regression. Okay, What you're seeing here is a regression where we're trying to predict the bulk modulus values and compare those to the actual values. So the y-axis is our predicted values. The x-axis is the actual values in our test set. Okay, You can see how we do. Again, things that are above 300 and whatever, 10 or something, are extraordinary. They're the top 1%, so those are our extraordinary compounds. Well, some things got misclassified. For example, these ones down here in the purple region, they were predicted to have quite low values, like 175. So those ones, we got it wrong. And these ones over here, we predicted that they were quite high, and so we got those ones wrong. So we can actually choose a Y value cutoff to maximize our overall score. So we get the most values in this green section, those are our true positives, and the fewest values in our blue and purple regions, which are our false positives and false negatives. Okay, So we choose the Y value that maximizes that outcome, that gives us the best possible performance, and yeah, we can do it. It put 90% of the data that was true negatives in the right box. It put 4% of the data as false positives, it put 1% uh, of the data as false negatives, and 5% of the data went in our true positives. That's pretty good, meaning when we predicted that something was correct, uh, how often were we getting it right? About 50-50, 5% and 4%, so it was about a 50-50 thing. And in terms of recall, we were able to capture a good amount of the data, the majority of the data we were able to capture. So yeah, is regression possible? It is. Um, and you can see how much the data, most of it's down here by these histograms. You can see that mostly it's down here. It's these margins that we're paying attention to. Okay, But something that we discovered that was pretty clever is here on the right-hand side. When we, instead of trying to think of this as a uh, regression problem where we're trying to predict the actual bulk modulus value, which has value, because knowing, knowing what the specific value is is maybe what you want, but maybe you don't care what the value is. Maybe what you care about is you just want to find new extraordinary materials. You don't care about knowing its exact value. You just want to know, is it in the top 1% or not? Well, in that case, it's a classification. Now you're classifying it as ordinary or extraordinary. And so using a logistic regression or some other classifier, we can start to do that. I think this is a logistic regression. What you see now here, this is the probability of being extraordinary versus our bulk modulus. So it's the exact same approach as before. We can still have false negatives and false positives, 
and true positives and true negatives, but overall our scores perform better, about twice as better, right? Our true positives are now 6% of the data. We have basically 0% as false negatives and only 3% of our data as false positives. That's pretty slick. So to answer our question that we set out to answer, is extrapolation possible? Yeah, it looks like it is. And not only we showed that simple models did better earlier with the, with the linear one that we showed you here, that a linear model outperformed a, a, a random forest. Now we can add to that finding that simple models might do better, but now we can say they do better and classification might outperform regression. Right? Treating it as just a binary classification might do even better. Now, I've shown you only one material property, right? So obviously we should try different algorithms and different properties. So what you're seeing here is bulk modulus, thermal conductivity, shear modulus, band gap, divide temperature, thermal expansion. So six different materials properties. And now we're going to try four different models. We're going to try ridge. That's a linear model with regularization. We learned about that in a previous video. We're going to try a support vector regression, which is a nonlinear, more complicated model using the support vector machine, but it's still a regression. And then we're going to do logistic regression. That's a classification. I know, terrible name. Logistic regression is a linear classification model compared to support vector classification. So the SVR and the SVC are more complicated models. The ridge and the logistic are simpler. Logistic and SVC are classification. Ridge and SVR are regressions. How do we do? Well, across the board, we see that our best performance comes from classification. And we see a slight edge, if I'm looking at it, in our total, total overall F-score, I see a slight edge towards linear models as opposed to complex models. So classification outperforms. Simpler models tend to actually do a little bit better here. And extrapolation looks possible. Now, we went to publish this, and we actually got some great reviewers. So whoever you are out there, we appreciate your comments because you had some great suggestions. Here's two things they pointed out. They said, OK, that's great and all, but <laughs> in your data, how would it have performed if there was a gap in your data? What do I mean? Like, Let's go back to this sort of drawing. What if you, because we trained it basically, we trained it all the way up to the 1%, and we included all that. They were basically saying, well, what if you chopped some portion of your data out right there so you have a gap now between your extraordinary materials and the not extraordinary ones. It's a great idea. And you can try and change the size of that gap. And then they, I don't know if they had it or if we did, but we, but we, somebody suggested that, well, you could do the same thing, not just with the X value of your target label. What if you had gaps in terms of the composition? So in other words, what if you never give it tungsten as a value to train on, and then you have it predict values that have tungsten? Right? How do you do that? That's a form of, ex of chemical extrapolation, right? So how do we do? Um, we tried that. We tried that with a bunch of different things, right? We would hold out certain elements, and then we would see if we can predict them. We would build in a, gr a gap and then see if we could predict and how that changed our performance. We would build in space group gaps, like if you never have a certain type of space group, how does it do in predicting that space group? And we basically say that even with these gaps, you're able to extrapolate. It does influence your performance a little bit, and you can read our paper there in Computational Material Science to learn a little bit more about it, but it's still possible. Um, it's a great, great, great suggestion, okay? Um, in fact, actually, here's some of our data. Here's showing all of our data. Here you can see your precision and your recall, so-called so rocking curves, right? And you can do this as a function of your gap size in your data. As you increase the gap size, does this really make you suffer or not? Um, it depends, right? It depends on which algorithm you're using, essentially. But no, it's pretty robust to even having gaps in your data is what we're finding here, okay? And then lastly, it might be kind of interesting to say, like, okay, we've got this tool, which if you look at our metrics here, like, think about how crazy this is. The precision, just look at precision for a minute. When I'm predicting whether a material is extraordinary or not, what's my precision? Well, if I'm using a classification model, I'm getting it right 60% of the time. If I'm using regression, I'm getting it right 40% of the time. Take the average of those. The model you're using, this is suggesting that about half the time, when you predict a new top 1% material, you're getting it right. Think how crazy that is. I mean, could you tell your grad student or your friend or your colleague or fellow scientist right now, um, out of these 10 materials, this one and this one are gonna be top 1% materials and could you have 50% accuracy in those predictions? That would be insane. You could be pumping out new extraordinary materials every day of the week if you wanted to, if that was the case. So is that the case, right? Well, it all comes down to whether or not we have a, our model trained on something that satisfies the IID assumption. 
we talked about the IID assumption when we talked about ensembling. That's our independent and uh, identically distributed assumption of our data, meaning does the training data really match the real world data, right? So this is a little bit tricky to sort of, we don't know because we don't know what the real world, we don't know what the true unknown distribution of data is, right? We have things that we could sort of compare it to. Here's our top 1% in our uh, A-flow data, right? Using this classification approach, here's the things that showed up in the top 1%. And then let's go ahead and use our model to predict the top 1% materials of actual materials that have been made. So that's things from the PCD database, the Pearson Crystal database. And then let's compare them. And if you look at what elements are present, you know, this is heavy on carbo, carbon, nitrogen, rhenium, tungsten, you know, main group elements and your transition metals, right? And basically the same thing happens here, but the range is not the exact same, but it's certainly compelling to say we're probably not far too far off. So in the real world, if I sent my students to the lab and tried to discover new top 1% materials, how would this do? Would I really get 50% or slightly better? Um, this is encouraging. This is what I would say is probably encouraging. So yeah, I, I hope we've put to bed this, this question, can you extrapolate? Let's summarize. Yeah, you can. Simple models might outperform complex ones, right? Linear ones might outperform other ones. And classification seems to outperform regression. That's a pretty cool finding. So uh, I hope that was interesting. In our next video, we're going to turn our attention to clustering. So that's an unsupervised machine learning technique, which is valuable for a lot of what we do in materials informatics. So stay tuned. We'll talk about clustering next.